Okay, so I think we'll uh, assume everyone's <laughs> refilled their coffee cup and back to the screens. So uh, yeah, we have our last talk actually in our uh, topic of optimization of subsurface with new technology. And uh, so that talk will be held by Thierry Yaquin. Apologies if I'm mispronouncing the second name there. So he was presenting from uh, Geolink and his talks title has sparked particular interest for me. So this talk will be titled um, Determining Structural High Areas that are promising for hydrogen generation in the Norwegian Sea. So Thierry has a broad academic and in industry geoscience experience spanning from your CV you sent me nearly 40 years actually. So yeah, very uh, expansive experience. And Thierry is the director of the geoscience consulting company Geolink, which he created in 1996. Who will, who will he will present on behalf of today. So with that, Thierry, I kind of pass the word to you and uh, look forward to your talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sharing my screen. Here is it. Here it is. Is it OK? Yes. Yeah, perfect. So this is not an underexplored play, but it's totally unexplored play, the church for native hydrogen. We are at the beginning, in fact, it's only one year work and uh, we have some hope and hopefully there will be some, a future behind this research. We are really at the research stage. The purpose is not looking for hydrogen in well-known mature oil and gas areas like across the tilted fall blocks, where effectively when you look at the data, there is no geological reason for having native hydrogen. You will see on the contrary, that we will be looking at either far to the west at the transition from the exhumed domain and the oceanic domain, or far to the east, uh, like above, above thick continental crust, such as, for instance, the Froyer High setting. And there, uh, away from any known petroleum source rock, there may be a potential, but we will see. We will see in the future. We don't have any, we don't have yet any hydrogen, but we have a lot of evidence for an active hydrogen system. Uh, uh, state of the art. First, uh, there is a long list of known emanation over the world, which is uh, increasing each month, uh, in particular close to Norway along the mid oceanic ridge and in Iceland. And recent measurements are showing up to 60, 70 percent of hydrogen from the from the gas emanation. We have other examples in wells discovering hydrogen in, in, in Australia, in Brazil, in the States, and across uh, various mountain belts and all over the world. And not only hydrogen, but abiotic methane as well. Uh, these emanations are concerning the different tectonic settings from the extensional zones, like the mid-oceanic ridge, the compressional zones uh, involving ophiolite naps, and we are looking for the serpentinization of the of the mafic mineral from this ophiolite depths, as well as in the Pyrenees, so for, for instance, right now in France, and also stable in intracratonic basins like in Africa, and why not far to the north in uh, in Norway with a uh, with a uh, uh, Precambrian uh, iron-rich rocks. Typically, onshore the hydrogen emanations are occurring along these circles. This, um, kilometer size depression, but are called ferry circles. And you will see that you may find similar type of features here offshore of your Norway. There is a first production well in Mali that is producing for, uh, uh, for several years, has, has been producing for several years, and the volumes are high enough to feed a small city nearby. Uh, what about Norway? We are working on two settings, I told you, and I will just show a couple of yards concerning the western margin and then I will move on and document a case study on the Froyer High. Far to the west, we are looking uh, the which seems to be the most part, the most important part of the reactions in relationship with a, uh, a generation of hydrogen involving the state of valence of the iron Fe2 plus to where when it is oxidized into Fe3 plus. And this is occurring typically while you have oxidation of uh, ferroin oxide in, in, with respect to geothermal oil fluids, the serpentinization of the mafic 
or uh, iron-rich minerals, quinopyroxene and so on, which are producing also hydrogen. In hydrothermal context, where you have the precipitation of sulfates at temperature ranging between 300, 350 degrees, also with respect to the presence of water, and you have the precipitation of pyrite and uh, hydrogen production, and this will concern the western margin. And as, a, as an example, of course, we don't have sample today and we don't know if these reactions were active. We may suspect them to be active. And as a matter of fact, we have observed a series of gas emanation, deeply sourced, very deeply sourced, totally independent of the known Paleocene slash Eocene vent related to the volcan classical volcanic intrusions. And these gas emanations are feeding some gas accumulation up to sometimes 20 square kilometers. You, have, you don't have them on the picture here. Within the Miocene ooze, the diamicrite presented here, for instance, which seems to be a good reservoir, and being sealed below the condensed section of the Pleistocene. Interestingly, at the contact where the gas is escaping and not accumulated, I'm not showing you the accumulation here, we have these small depressions, which looks very similar to what is known onshore when, you gas, when the hydrogen is escaping. And here with in 3D, you clearly see the gas escaping from the cracks around the depression, which means the depression has been formed passively by the diffusion of the gas throughout the Miocene ooze, escaping underneath from the deeply rooted folds. Internally to the ooze, you have all the fabrics, which are quite interesting. I have never seen that elsewhere in 40 years, very peculiar fabrics within the Miocene ooze uh, and some significant accumulation of gas. This is not the purple because I will work later on the, on the, on the granite on the eastern margin. Last point, these emanations are strictly related, it's an example, uh, from leaking fault underneath, but regionally they are related to the <clears throat> structurally high elevation of the T reflector, the deep T reflector at about six to seven seconds, which is rising up. So it looks like there is a relationship between these deep rooted emanations and the underlying elevation of the T reflector. The second type of approach on the western margin will, will be respect with, will be with respect to the sulfur oxidation. And there we are looking at the oxidation of the sulfates and or like pyrite, and in particular, as a consequence between the interplay between the magmatic intrusion and various Cretaceous source rocks. I was quite interested by the present, previous presentation. We have mapped several source rocks across the Vöhring and Möhre area. The brown is almost low potential organic matter. The white is even nothing because there is no impedance contrast in the seismic data. Whereas you have these strong colors, your bright colors, which may indicate relatively high content of organic matter within the axis of these basins. So we are we are working, we will have a PhD student starting this month during three years. We are working on the interplay between this paleocene eocene magmatic intrusions and the development of these source rocks with respect to these uh, you see equations there. And we are working similarly uh, for the uppermost equations. So, what type of gas we may expect? Well, we used a recent sampling from Iceland by uh, Isabel Moretti, uh, our colleague uh, working in that area. Uh, and it shows that the gas emanation from the Icelandic uh, vents and volcanoes are mostly composed of CO2, some trace of H2SS, but also you may observe up to 60%, uh, 64% of hydrogen within escaping from some of the vents, of the vents. And also by comparison to the black fumarol coming out from the mid-oceanic -oceanic Atlantic Ridge, which are also known to, to show some hydrogen uh, emanations, the proportion are up to sometimes six to seven times what has been observed along the mid-oceanic ridge. So that this kind of volcanic activity is able to produce, in addition to the classical CO2, some H2S, nitrogen, and so on, is able to produce uh, some hydrogen, relatively high proportion. We know example up to 
75% as well, and some abiotic methane. So there is a potential. So these are the two settings we have been working only one year. Huh? It's really the beginning uh, to the west, the, the Cretaceous source rocks. And what I will present you today, these are the basement high, like the Froya high, and what is what is the potential for such a high closer to the margin? Or why this? Because when you took when you look at an analog uh, uh, geothermal wells in the Rhine Graben that has been published by Murray Al 2020, they have they have observed some hydrogen emanation from the granite in their geothermal wells. So they have modeled the process, and it turned out that depending of the temperature, which are not dramatic, uh, from 130 degrees to 200, and the degree of the oxidation, oxido reduction of oxidation within the system you may have more or less production of hydrogen, low to nothing at low temperature and poor potential oxidation. And as an indicator, as soon as you observe within your coating, uh, within the fracture of the granite, the uh, chamosite, for instance, this is indicated that the system is not active, is not producing hydrogen. But conversely, as soon as you observe the precipitation of magnetite and or hematite, the hematite is the best, you can make sure that we have a relatively large proportion of hydrogen being produced, which correspond to the proper and suitable oxidoreduction conditions and temperature. The source of the hydrogen is always the age of the water. It's not coming out from the minerals. The volumes that are concerned uh, by modeling here, for instance, uh, if you take into account the volume of granite that that will be that will be uh, the volume of granite that will be drained by one well, geothermal wells, more or less one, one cubic kilometer, this, will potent, this may potentially correspond to 100 kiloton of hydrogen, which is enormous. It corresponds to 0.2% of the annual volume produced eventually. Of course, we never reach these values because we never, uh, the fracture within the basement, never uh, give an access to all the biotite content within the granite, but 10 to 20 percent of that is realistic and still the numbers are quite high, quite high. This implies that the destabilization process for the H2 production is necessary. And as long as you don't have this, uh, this destabilization process, the increase in temperature, circulation of hot waters and so on, you have still a potential for producing uh, hydrogen. Or there is also a catalyzer that is quite active in such a system, is a presence in CO2. In CO2. You, can, you can enhance the process by injecting CO2 or volcanic activity, of course, with the CO2 content may trigger the process to generate hydrogen. And I will, I will speak about the Froyer High. This is a view towards the southeast of the eastern margin of the Vöhring Basin. You recognize the Trondelat platform, the Elgeland Basin, the Northern Ridge. Donna Terrace, Alpen Terrace, and when you move south of the Tron de la Platform, you will have the Froyer High. I have draped here the gravimetry, the filtered Bouguet gravimetry anomaly onto the BCU, and you will see at, at the top of the Froyer High various gravimetry anomaly. We will, we will look at that and behind blue, the Froyer Basin. It's quite complex, you will see. What is interesting is that the well drilled over the Froyer High can reach the substratum called in the past basement with some weathered part. And that substratum is interesting because uh, uh, core reports are showing that there are coat, coating of hematite along the fractures of the, of the granite, which is a very good indicator for an active system sometime in the past. Now, if we zoom in over the Froyer High, you recognize the outline of the Froyer High here. This is a tilt derivative uh, magnetic uh, data. It shows bright colors, which are northwest sources trending, and these colors are defining a series of antiform and synform, antiform and synform. If you look at a seismic line across the synform and reaching the next magnetic anomaly, positive anomaly to the west, you clearly see that uh, the antiform pattern is related to the rising of uh, a lowermost, a lowermost unit that is highly reflective. I will go back to that. 
You also recognize uh, the, some faulting across the Fourier, Fourier high, which correspond to this faulting that is controlling first the Fourier basin, this one, and then there will be some antithetic faults also that will affect uh, uh, reflectors deeper than uh, what we call the top of the acoustic basement, the purple reflector, which means you will see there will be sedimentary succession below what is generally called uh, the acoustic basement. We think that we will have late Paleozoic depot centers before you reach the proper uh, Caledonian substratum. As an example, we have compared, we are look, working over the entire area. We have compared this with various locations of the Northland Ridge. This is a top Permian structure map with all the fault at Permian level. And we do recognize the same kind of partitioning of the substratum below the top of the so called acoustic basement. You will always observed a lowermost highly reflective units and then various reflective units in between below the top permian already there and this is permian probably partly carboniferous hard to tell boundary is difficult but permian for sure and then you have the triassic and then the pre lowermost olocton we, we don't know what it is of course so just to indicate that it's not coming from nowhere it has been mapped all over the area and we uh, we can define various units and we can map them even and we have made various maps that this series of antiform and sin form if you take the perpendicular of their axis it will give you uh, the direction of transport for the caledonian maps and it is consistent with observer observation that you can make in the lowermost units uh, highly reflective units you can extract the deep of this claniform type sigmoidal pattern from the lowermost unit, which will give you the direction of transport direction. It's consistent all over the area. It's not coming perpendicular to the, ma to the margin. It's really not parallel. It's oblique. It's against, it's perpendicular to the axis of this antiform and sin form. So this is quite interesting in, uh, in terms of structural development. Now, if you juxtapose the, to this antiform and sinform structures, the map of the top of the, of the acoustic basement, the purple reflector, you clearly see a one-to-one -one relationship between Paleo Valley at top acoustic basement yeah, and the eye in between. Uh, once again, uh, if you look at the reflective, uh, lowermost reflective alloctone, which is rising there and being dropping down to the northwest due to this extensional fault. This rising high corresponds to the red color we are there, dropping down on the other side, and then to the southeast, you are back to the, to the Froan Basin. In addition to that, we have identified, and this is not the purpose here, I will not develop that on that side, it's another story. We have identified various units that are tentatively dated of the Carboniferous and Devonian affected by normal faulting below the regional reflector being back classically as the top of the acoustic basement, which is, it's called, uh, we should call this the substratum, of course, and which will give us an idea of the age of this major fault controlling the structure, which are obviously occurring during late Devonian time as they are controlling this Devonian and Carboniferous depot center. As an argument, we don't have that is direct datation of the sandstones eventually preserved below the Triassic in these structures because there is an undated section of massive sandstone in the basal part there. But as an argument, the Jurassic Reservoir on the western side of the Froyer High are yielding carboniferous working systematically, even to the west of the Sclina Ridge at Cretaceous level, even for the source. And you have this systematic carboniferous working, clearly indicating that nearby there may be some carboniferous and Devonian, because it's carboniferous question mark Devonian. In addition, the conglomerate made up of granite elements built by this well, by comparison to onshore Devonian structures, I think can be interpreted as also Devonian, and we have also further uh, evidence for carboniferous working for the south. So this is, give, this is giving us a constraint on the, on, the, on the timing of the fault, of the extensional fault. And if we move from the source of the Froya High, 
obviously you see this major normal fault controlling Devonian, the Devonian conglomerates, major fault either tipping towards the west or dipping towards the east, or the fault which are affecting the Caledonian complex and deeply rooted fault penetrating the lowermost highly reflective unit and even below within the potential altered basement and defining as a consequence a very important shear zone uh, along the, at the contact with this lowermost uh, layer red reflector. Uh, we can, as I told you, we have mapped various units, uh, systematically transparent layer red, transparent layer red, they are repeating several times, corresponding probably to, possibly to several alloctone units, the transparent faces being the granite, which of a granite, granite type rocks, which is enriched in, in biotite. This timing of the fault fits quite well with the publication of Norwegian geologist Onshore. Uh, this is the age we observed here that correspond to this extensional uh, collapse features controlling Devonian deposenters onshore. And it fits also quite well with, with a very nice model published by Perron Pinvitzik. Uh, uh, showing a uh, divergent faulting controlling pal late Paleozoic deposenters, exactly what we do observe here around the Froya Hall. Oh, what do we have? Why I'm showing you that? Because in that area, we have observed uh, several gas chimneys escaping from the basement, from the substratum, and first scattered, and then more and more developed when you move southward. And these gas chimneys are penetrating across the Cretaceous tertiary sedimentary cover up to Miocene. It's pretty well dated. We have some wells here. And uh, this is the middle Miocene erosional surface and even Pliocene uh, reaching the late Pliocene. So these gas chimneys are able to cut throughout everything up to the surface, being sealed by the overlying unit. I will go back to that. And we don't see any poke marks at sea bottom related to that gas chimney, to this gas chimneys. Once again, the antiform in the lowermost alloctone is visible by the TDA magnetics here, right there. We are located here. When we move further south, you will notice that uh, the magnetic data is revealing a kind of complex distribution of spot-like anomalies. And these spot-like anomalies, you will see, correspond to magmatic intrusions and gas chimneys, something you don't see northward to the north. You see, it's totally missing. And these are the Vesbrona seals and, and magmatic intrusions. It's very important to realize that these Vesbrona seals are made up of alkaline intrusion. I will go back to that, the so Nephelinite, Nephelinites. The chimneys that you will observe in that area are systematically related to this deeply rooted fault, as you can see there. And otherwise, there will be a complex network of seal and dike. I will go back to that here. And with some gas escaping from place to place. Overall, it's a more regional picture. We have mapped these uh, gas occurrences. We have mapped the various chimneys, the dike, the seal, and so on. It is ongoing in just one year project with some students and, and myself and so on. And the literature uh, is showing some, is giving us some age of the nephre, of the Vesbrona seals of, of the injections. It's Paleocene, most lower, middle to late Paleocene, due to the fact that some of the uh, seals are subcropping on sea bottom due to subsequent uplift of the margin. So this is giving us some constraint of the seal. However, the chimneys and related features are systematically much younger. They are cutting through the Paleocene, Eocene, and as I told you, reaching the Miocene, as indicated there. So that it's a long duration of events, starting with the seal intrusion in Paleocene time, but, but with a continuous volcanic activity and also uh, degassing, uh, gas emanation throughout the tertiary. Some of these features are related to volcano, and I will show you that, and you will see clear uh, volcano and lava flow. I'm zooming in now on the, on the magnetic maps on the western side, and effectively we have two domains. The domain in which you observe these spot-like anomalies related to the seal and vents, and seal and dikes, 
and a domain with very bright elongated uh, anomalies, blue blue colors here, which correspond in fact to the underlying also to correspond with the underlying fault pattern at Paleozoic level affecting the substratum. That line is the one crossing everything, the northwest to southeast, and crossing the, the ABC lines that are along the axis of this blue anomaly. You see these chimneys quite nice. Also, you see some seal. Uh, there are numerous, you see, it's not just one example. There will be a lot. And it corresponds systematically to uh, a very strong anomaly in the, uh, in the, with the magnetic data. For instance, as soon as you have a strong anomaly, you can check, you will find a, a chimney, a volcano, or something related to these intrusions. Uh, you see uh, various intrusion and gas emanation. The next slide, the next line is the uh, easternmost one here, following the blue axis. And here also, you will see a lot of seals. You will see gas chimneys, various types of seals, and you can uh, highlight them uh, like that. And various emanation, uh, uh, some of them reaching the pl uh, latest Pliocene and conformity, some of them dying out at Paleocene level, depending of the of the, of the development of the of the of the chimneys. The section is well dated. Uh, we have various well and and seismic interpretation to age date properly uh, what is penetrated by this uh, intrusion and gas chimneys. The next line is following that axis, and uh, you will notice our, our little polygon with a, an alignment of polygons which correspond to volcanoes. They are pretty nice. A series of volcanoes, uh, like here. This one is particularly well developed. Uh, the, vol the volcanoes are diachronous. This one is, is pre early YP3, early, early Ypresian. These ones are post early Ypresian, YP3. And they are capped here by the light green, which is the Lutetian and conformity. Some of them are uh, above, reaching even post Lutetian, and deforming all everything up to the dark pink, the, the Miocene and conformity. Now, these volcanoes are well developed. We could call this the Volcano Valley, more or less, with the alignments. Uh, it's amazing. And we can map the lava flow, it's, it's really consistent. And uh, like that, I have indicated. Uh, oh, I have uh, I have indicated several uh, several emanations. Just to co to convince you about the volcanic pattern and not a mud volcano, a proper uh, lava volcano, uh, you can extract the amplitude, and you clearly see around the around the volcanic chimney, which corresponds to the top of the structure here. You clearly see the lava flow uh, following the amplitude and the knee, uh, on both sides in 3D. And uh, if you make slice, you clearly see uh, the lava flow around the volcano. And there are several of these volcanoes aligned with the underlying structures affecting the basement, and each of them corresponding to the magnetic to a magnetic anomaly. Timing is uh, during the Eocene, uh, being capped by the here the Lutetian and conformity and reaching. Uh, the uh, the Miocene and conformity uh, there. Sorry to interrupt, Terry. It's yes. Just a few minutes left. Okay. Okay. Well, I'm I'm moving. I'm it's almost done. I'm moving. Well, I'm moving uh, to uh, other examples uh, like that, uh, and I'm moving to the fact that why I'm showing you that, because uh, the juxtaposition of mafic intrusion at top of granitic basement, which contains emetite, is an indication of an active system, and we think that. The intrusion of this uh, uh, nephelonite is, is, uh, is, has been active enough to, to oxidize, uh, to create an oxidation of the biotite contained within the granite, as observed by the emetite coating the fractures of the granite. Ah, here it's. Uh, we have this emanation. We need a, a sealing capacity, and effectively, locally, we have dated and observed that there was no pock mark at sea bottom, and the sealing will be made by the lower Pliocene condensation, section, which are which is draping just below and preserved from subsequent erosion at the base play 
Pleistocene, base Pleistocene, as indicated in that well. And you have the gas emanation, and effectively, there is no gas penetrating the Pleistocene sediments above. You can extract the amplitude, you can separate what is properly thermogenic to the west, deriving from long distance migration, and from the amplitude anomalies to the east that are related to uh, this gas emanation. This is, this is, this is, this is, this is another, another way to observe this uh, interplay along the structural surface between the underlying uh, volcanic activity and the amplitude anomaly here related to the gas chimney. In conclusion, uh, the presence of this iron-rich mineral within the granite or within also the mafic minerals from the western margin, uh, together with their oxidation, are favorable conditions for generate uh, the hydrogen. And, and this, also, this also will include the pyrite, the sulfates, con uh, comprised within the content section of the Cretaceous. And here, concerning the basement structure, the hydrothermal alteration of the iron Fe2 plus oxidized into Fe3 plus will be uh, the process that generates, probably, that has generated uh, this hydrogen during the oxidation of these iron rich minerals. We need this destabilization here for the granite of the, uh, of the biotite by magmatic intrusion, alors, both extrusive and intrusive. And we have observed, for instance, along the western margin, other magmatic intrusion, not only the Paleocene, but up to Miocene time, even Pliocene, question marks, in particular no, along the northwest southeast fault corridor, like the Yon Mayan fault corridor, probably in relationship with the Icelandic curve. And then we do observe the potential shallow reservoir and seal rock distribution, in particular the sealing by the Pliocene flooding events above the backstepping sandstone, either related to the Miocene and conformity or upper Pliocene and conformity. And then we have to look at this shallow gas to discriminate what is thermogenic coming from long distance migration and what I call ambiguous, not simple today, which may come from this deep source and then related to uh, this deeply rooted gas ship, say, either above, below, within the Miocene or above the Miocene and conformity and away from any petroleum source rock. We still don't have hydrogen, but there is clearly a potential. Okay, thank, thank you. you, Terry. Very exciting uh, concept and really nice presentation. A lot of uh, interesting observations there. It's a lot of uh, round of applause hands coming up on screen. I think um, in the interest of time, we will need to move on, but there's been a number of questions in the chat, so I hope perhaps you could maybe respond to those uh, in the chat, if that's okay, and we'll uh, we'll move on to the next presentation. But again, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, really exciting and interesting. It's definitely the first I've uh, heard of such concepts. So, yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Bye.